Well, thank you. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. I have absolutely no idea what Paulina just said. Um, she said it's a grand staged entrance, there's a bio, so I hope it was all nice. Uh, but it is a real pleasure for me to have a chance to be here with you today. Uh, I'm nervous. This is a big speech for me. One of the biggest of my life, in fact. And you're all looking at me like I'm a little nut, but I'll explain that. Uh, I left Microsoft, retired, whatever the appropriate word is, uh, a month ago. This first speech I'll give, uh, maybe the last two if it doesn't go well, uh, as something other than a Microsoft employee. So I'm a little nervous, and I said, oh, what do you talk about now? I wound up picking some themes that are about the same as I would have talked about when I was at Microsoft. Uh, but I am clearly the former CEO, and I speak to you today just about some things uh, that, you know, I would say upon reflection, uh, I learned about business and kind of business life. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, I understand the way the for format works here. If my first comments are dull, you'll take me whatever direction is interesting to you. So uh, let's, let's try it out. Uh, I joined Microsoft uh, 34 years ago. Uh, at the time, the company was 30 people. We had done two and a half million of good revenue the year before I started. Uh, and, you know, I'd been, let me just say, screwing around in school uh, during the first five years of the company's history. And when I joined, the company was already five years old. Uh, you could say two and a half million is a lot of money, and it is. You could say 30 people is a lot of money, and it, and it is. But compared to the 80 billion or so of revenue that we do today and 100,000 people, I think it's probably fair to say I joined a startup. Uh, I joined a startup. And it's hard to talk about Microsoft like a startup now, but I think I've got kind of a unique perspective. I've worked from, for a company of 30 people, 100,000 people, and every size in between. And I think to myself, wow, that's pretty unique. Uh, we've done things well, we've screwed things up, we've had a combination of all of the above, but it does give you a little bit of lessons and perspective. People want to say, okay, what do we do in our startup? I say, hey, I have a couple ideas. Some CEO who's running some 40,000 person company, I have some ideas. Uh, and certainly one of the things you, you learn as you go through this is no, none of the phases are the same. I mean, the, the journey, the ride, the experience has been nothing short of amazing, if nothing else in terms of its volatility. I joined a company that existed before there was an IBM PC. One of the, in fact, first things I did was go to, I could wear a suit. I was good at wearing a suit compared to all the other people in the startup. So I became a salesman uh, on our first relationship with IBM, building the IBM personal computer. And you say, wow. You know, there's a phase there where our whole world as a startup was about sort of helping this larger company. Our fate, everything about our success as a tiny little 30-person company was by doing a good job of servicing the needs of this company that had, I don't know, 300,000 people, even at that time. And IBM was by far the biggest thing in the technology business. We used to call it the bear. Ride the bear, hang on to IBM. And we spent about, you know, really probably five, six years doing that until we got into a phase where we said, okay, what are we creating and crafting? And that's really where we kind of birthed what I would consider modern Microsoft. Windows and Office, uh, late 80s, early 90s. We were in the process of giving birth to the business that would wind up really being the business on which our company would explode. We went through a period then where we did get some critical mass. And all of a sudden you have to say, well, geez, we were all about starting something. We were bootstrapping Windows and, and, and Word and Excel from nothing. Now all of a sudden it's about spinning that flywheel, the hamster wheel. That's a good thing to do in business. When you have enough success that what you need to do is pedal fast, that's good. A lot of people try to pedal fast before they have anything that's worth pedaling. And a lot of other people never pedal fast. So it's kind of a life lesson. Get a good idea and then work like hell 
to make it popular. That was a phase for Microsoft. That was a wonderful phase. Probably the favorite phase is when you're taking something that you know is a germ of a good idea and you're just working hard on it, you're scaling it up, you're actually not thinking quite as hard. You could say, well, that's a mistake, and I'll say, yeah, you're sure right about that. I'll come back to that as a life lesson in a minute. But that was a wonderful phase. Then we get to what I'll call the dark years. And if you're successful enough, you're going to have dark years. Why do you get dark years? If you're successful enough, you can run afoul of antitrust legislate or antitrust authorities. That's, you could say, whoa. Any startup would say, I don't want that problem. On the other hand, most startups should say, God, I wish I was that popular enough for that to happen. It's sort of a double-edged sword. But you also find out that the thing that you did that made you successful on the first attempt may not sustain you. One of the things I've learned about our business, and, and I guess this expression works just as well in the UK as it does in the US, do you talk about a one-trick pony? Pony you could teach one trick? Many companies are essentially one-trick ponies. I mean, if you're a one-trick pony in business, you are fantastically successful. You learned how to do something brilliantly. You invented one thing, you got it right, that is optimum. And if you're a real great one-trick pony, your trick, if you're lucky enough, your trick might last for 100 years or 200 years. I mean, Coca-Cola is basically a 100-year-old trick. It's pretty good. Uh, I know this is, I'm running a little bit of danger with the next one, but Brand Oxford, you know, that's a, what, 900,000-year trick? It's a good one? No, I, I mean, that, look, I tell people, if you can aspire to be anything in brands, aspire to be like Oxford, or I went to Harvard, so I pick on Harvard, but aspire to be on brands that always look at like they're at the cutting edge, even hundreds of years later. But in a lot of businesses, you're forced to do a second trick or you die. And if you don't do your second trick, and you could say you should do every trick. You should do the second, and the third, and the fourth, and the fifth. But really, the history of business is, most people do one trick, they run with it as long as that trick works, and then they fade out. We were fortunate. We came up with the second trick. How do you really take microprocessors and push them in and do the back-end automation of business? There was a day when, uh, it's crazy now, when there was a thing called a mainframe that was actually a popular form of computing. I, I know this is a bit antique at this stage because my, my 14 year old asked me the other day, Dad, what does IBM do? <laughs> uh, which, okay, maybe you're just old enough that that's not a stunning question, but the truth of the matter is the world I grew up, IBM was everything for automating business computing. And yet we really pushed microprocessors into the very fabric of the way businesses work. That was our second trick. And we basically, out of those two tricks, we have gotten 80 billion of revenue and 20 billion of profit. And people will ask me, well, why didn't you do the third trick right? And I'll say, damn, I'm upset. I, let's call that phones just for a second. And I'll say, Ugh! I don't know whether we were too busy or we only knew the tools of the first two tricks, but we've done two, and you know what the challenge is now? Those two tricks will go for a lot of years. But in our industry, you gotta do a third trick. There's no 100-year tricks in the technology business. And being a multi-trick pony, if you do two tricks, I'd say Apple did two tricks. They started, they built the Mac, they almost went bankrupt, jobs came back, and they did a second trick around low power uh, touch computing, which started with iPod and went from there. It's an amazing company because it did two tricks. We're an amazing company because we did two tricks. And one of the questions you ask yourself is, how do you do multiple tricks? There's a few principles that I would highlight for this audience. Uh, in terms of business success. And the first one's probably not one that gets talked about as much as it should. That's that ideas do matter. You really do need a powerful idea to have a business that's going to succeed, whether it's at very small scale or very large scale. You need an idea that is significant. In the world today, it's easy to read about, oh, start up this, start up that, start up the other thing. I was in uh, uh, San Francisco the other day, and people were basically telling me you can start businesses now and get venture capital without an idea. That sort of 
interesting. Uh, I would say the quality of most of the ideas that I hear about anyway, they're just not that powerful. And people spend too little time trying to get the right idea. Getting the right idea is really hard because you have to work at it, you might have to fail at it, you might have to modify it, you might have to give it up and try another idea, but you've got to decide how to think about the idea. How, anybody here seen a, a, an older movie called Thelma and Louise by any chance? It's a story of, uh, with Susan Sarandon and uh, Gina Davis, and there are these two women who seem normal at the start of the movie, and by the end, they're driving their car off a cliff. Uh, I won't fill in the details, but it was Brad Pitt's first movie, for those of you who care. But you could say, you know, they really ran fast in that. They, by the end of the movie, they were running fast. I'm just not sure I would want to follow them off the cliff. And yet a lot of people say, fall in love with their first idea and just keep at it. And don't stop and say, okay, what are other ideas? Are there better ideas? Are there other ways to think about this idea? And yet in business, and I don't care whether you're as big as Microsoft is today or as small as Microsoft was the day I started, ideas matter. Two tricks made the whole company, basically. And the third trick is out there waiting to be, be invented or invented by a startup or a business that you'll join or a larger business that can do certain kinds of innovation. But ideas matter. Second, you better be passionate about whatever you want to do in life. This is not just true startups, big companies, small. Passion matters. Too many people don't really get revved up and fired up and consumed heart, body, and soul by what they do. And yet I find that sort of really sad. You really want to do something you can fall in love with. Particularly coming right out of college, I did it. You know, oh, my resume, I gotta work on my resume. I gotta take a job where I can learn, check the resume, I'm gonna have. And okay, maybe for one job that's okay, it's not ideal. But really finding something that you can get passionate about, I was lucky. I mean, for me it was pure luck. I, I never thought I was gonna join a small company. I always assumed I'd join a big company. My dad had worked for a big company, blah, 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 blah. But I got to do so many things and help create basically a whole industry. And I got, and I was lucky. I loved the people, I loved the leadership, I loved the technology, I loved the impact on the world, I loved the fact that we had brainiacs who worked for us, that was kind of cool, could be a pain in the butt too, but it was kind of cool. I, I found something that I loved, and I do think passion, passion absolutely matters. Optimism. Smart people love to be negative. It's my basic sort of summary of life. Smart people love to be critical, they love to be negative, they love to find fault, and you have to to succeed. On the other hand, if you really want to be successful, you have to stay optimistic. Colin Powell, who, who ran the Joint Chiefs of Staff for the US, has written books on leadership, but he's got one line I love. I love, optimism is a force multiplier. Some of the folks I was sitting down with uh, uh, I don't know what you call it, the other part of the union, uh, some of the union members before we started, you know, we were, we were talking about goofy YouTube speeches and videos that some of them had watched of me speaking. And w why? I am optimistic, and leaders, whether they're optimistic or not, you better project it. Because if you're not leading with optimism, if you don't believe, nobody else is going to go your direction. Nobody's going to be with you. Nobody's going to follow. Nobody's really going to buy in. So optimism, passion, uh, execution and measurement. You better stay on top of yourself and, and really measure. Unless people measure themselves, you don't get any better. You cannot succeed unless you are really holding yourself accountable and owning outcomes. Believe me, I've seen plenty of people at Microsoft, various places in the tech industry, brilliant people who when it came time to execute and actually count success, and eh, maybe not so much. Maybe not so much. You could, in order to do that, you have to actually know what the goal is. If the goal was to get to 450 million users and then sell to Facebook, WhatsApp did a hell of a job. Right, and, and I mean that, it's not a, I mean, it's a hell of a job at 19 billion, 55 people, that's a hell of a job. But you have to decide what outcome do you want? 
Bill Gates was offered $7.5 million to sell all of Microsoft in 1979. It would have been a rich guy if he had taken it. Richer if he didn't, but a rich guy. But <laughs> even putting that aside, the impact on society wouldn't have been the same. We had discussions with Facebook about buying Facebook, but Zuckerberg knew what he viewed as a, an outcome that he really desired and was willing to put in the blood, sweat, and tears just like we were. So execution and measurement are hugely important, and yet people let themselves uh, off the hook. You gotta get in the weight room. I don't know if that expression works at all, but I'll explain it. Uh, <laughs> certainly in American football, about the most important thing you can do is get yourself stronger. And a lot of companies don't do that. They're good at something, and then they don't build new muscle. They don't train. I mean, right now you'd say, hey, look, you got a small market share in the phone business, Steve. Why do you guys even screw around? Blah, 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 blah. Because we're in the weight room, baby. We're getting good. We're getting to know what it really takes to make small form factor devices. We're really understanding what's capable, what's possible in the hardware. If you don't get in the weight room, you can't win the next generation. You can't. If Apple had not been a hardware company with some software, they couldn't have come back in the generation of the, of the iPod, even with Steve Jobs returning. If we hadn't built the muscle that we've built in search, we'd have no cap possibility of doing some of the things that we're doing. It's a lesson that I think very few businesses, companies, government, they're not willing to do things that don't lead to immediate, immediate productivity. And then I would say last but not least, you guys gotta be hardcore. I've tried to come up with better words, tenacious, bold, long-term, and I kinda mean all of those. You just gotta be hardcore. People will encourage you to give up on everything. People have some notion that success startups, boom, they're just immediately successful. That is not true. I could say that more forcefully, but I won't. That is not true. Most startups, most anything, you work at it 5, 10, 15 years before things really emerge. It's the exception that emerges in two or three years. And you've got to make a big long-term bet You've got to have an idea that matters. You've got to stay after it. You've got to measure yourself. But you have got to be hardcore. Optimistic, for sure. Realistic, for sure. Measuring yourself. Tuning your idea. But you just have to stay. Build the new capabilities that you need. But stay hardcore and committed uh, for the future. I think back on 34 years of working for companies of all sizes. And it, without using the PowerPoints I had done, that's what I remember that I wanted to share with you. I will say that when you're all done with something, it's, 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 it's sort of an amazing thing. 34 years, other than my family, I put my heart, soul, I have basically hardly any hobbies, a little bit of golf, but hardly any hobbies, not much that I do except work and be with my family. I'll have to figure out what the new form of work is for me. But then you reflect and you say, okay, what, what do you really get excited about? And I think back and I say, God, it was kind of cool. We birthed an industry. I was one of many people who was part of it, but I, I feel good about that. You feel good about your successes. You feel your mistakes. And believe me, I feel mistakes. I know what mistakes we've made along the way, and I, I feel badly about them. You can't change them, but I remember them. You remember uh, people, uh, people that I'll stay friends with and stay in touch with, and people I will never see again in my life. I've had the experience of probably meeting as many people I will never talk to again as anybody other than mm, politicians or something. Maybe more, because I get to do it in more countries than your average politician. And yet, you know, there's just amazing people I've had a chance to, to talk to, see, learn from. I won't name names right now, but one of the coolest was a guy I met on my very last trip. I was traveling in Europe, a political leader in some country not to be named, and the guy actually sung a song to me. And I just think back, wow, I got a chance to see some real, it was karaoke, I don't want you to <laughs> get the wrong idea uh, about that. Uh, it was kind of a karaoke kind of thing. Uh, and then you think about the stories. To me, the, by far the most thing, fun thing, the fun story, 
two of them. The night we signed our first contract with IBM to do the original operating system on the IBM PC, still, I can think of that evening and I'm exhilarated. I remember the process, I remember the first sales call, the second, the third, the fourth. We worked on this thing for a year. A year later, we signed the contract. I can tell you where we went out and had a drink. We watched the TV show Dallas. It was an important episode. It's back in a new form today, but it was a modern show uh, in, in 1981. That, to me, was huge. But the big night, 1995. It's really the night computers took off, for all intent and purposes, the launch of Windows 95. And I was driving around from computer store to computer store to computer store with two or three guys just watching to see how people would respond to buying these new computers uh, with Windows 95, which is really the first time, you know, that's when PCs went from being a 10 million year a year phenomenon to growing to be about 300 million a year, which it is today, but it took off on the back of that. And to see people and to see them lining up and queuing up for the first time, I gotta say it was as exhilarating as anything uh, I've ever done. I thought I'd share a little bit uh, when Paulina and I were talking on the phone. It seemed okay to spend maybe 20 minutes sharing some thoughts, so I will, but I think mostly we're gonna do Q&A, and I'll turn it over to Paulina to <laughs> tell us how to do that. Thank you all very much. Um,